Right, let's get going. Five past, or six past on the dot. Um, right, so welcome to this lecture on crime and criminal justice policy. Um, starting off with a couple of quotes out there. Um, to some extent, this is quite a small area of social policy. Criminal justice does not account for very much money in government terms at all. Um, but it is actually quite a sort of a moral barometer to some extent about the sort of society we are and the sorts of values we hold. And there's a couple of nice famous quotes up there, one from Nelson Mandela and one from Fyodor Dostoevsky, both pretty much saying the same thing, that um, to some extent how we treat people within criminal justice and particularly within prisons is reflected to some extent on the larger values um, that we have hold as a society in terms of social policy and welfare in particular. So though this is a small area, it is an insightful one um, in terms of the broader social system. The aims of the lecture, to explain the distinction between criminal justice policy and social policy, um, and some people would say there is a distinction, examine how criminal justice policy and criminology has encroached on wider social policy, and that's probably the biggest theme in this lecture is the convergence and to some extent the contamination of social policy by um, criminal justice or what I would call crime policy and if we get time which we probably won't to briefly consider some of the contemporary developments in the Scottish criminal justice policy although that's less important because the main thing is to really set out broad trends in the landscape rather than talk about the the sort of knickknacks of, of, of the actual sort of institutions and programs which you can re judge look at for yourself from the reading list um, criminal justice policy anyway is a very large area it's very substantial and it's always changing there's constant tinkering and reform and changes of names etc etc and it, it, it's more important to get a sense of broader trends and, and, and key issues and tensions than to worry or fixate yourself too much on exactly how um, the landscape is configured at any particular point in time to some extent the key juxtaposition is between Scotland and England and Wales or in, alternatively to talk about the British context but not because it, Scotland doesn't fundamentally differ in certain ways from England and Wales and increasingly that divergence is becoming more prominent but historically and for much of the period we're talking about the two systems have developed in parallel always with a close eye on each other um, and in the, the, the most contemporary period up to the, the um, ascension of the, 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 the SNP within government under new Labour criminal justice policy arguably converged quite considerably between Westminster and Scotland. So that's, that's the sort of key relationship to look at. We're thinking a bit conceptually to, to, about sort of key terms to begin with and what we mean by criminology, criminal justice policy, crime policy, social policy, etc. Criminology, quite simply, in its broadest sense, yeah, that's the academic discipline where we talk about crime. It's, it's pretty much everything. In the broad sense, ways of which we think and talk about crime, criminals and crime controllers, Garland and Sparks have talked about there. Criminal justice policy is in many respects much narrower. Criminal justice policy is the government policy that relates to criminal justice institutions. So that is prisons, that is the police, that is um, the Crown Office within the Scottish jurisdiction or the um, Crown Prosecution Service within the jurisdiction of England and Wales. So that's the sort of narrow fixation on the formal mechanisms through which we, we influence criminal justice institutions. But of course, beyond that, how we deal with crime is actually arguably much, much broader. Because of course, much of the recent initiatives to deal with crime uh, intrude on areas of health, intrude on areas of education, intrude on areas of social work. And criminology itself as a discipline recommends that because our theories about what causes crime and what the solutions are generally go beyond prison and policing to talk about families and relationships, addiction issues, etc, etc, etc. So it's not surprising in a way what, what really constitutes perhaps the more important focus is what I would call crime policy. And crime policy is the totality of the ways in which the government responds to crime, which will often go much farther beyond the formal traditional institutions, which often actually are rumble on like a tank, unwavering and unchanging, particularly things like prisons. Very, very hard to fundamentally change the function or, or the structure of prisons. Other things you can do around crime um, with other agencies are more flexible and creative. <coughs> 
Now, does this fit with social policy at all? Now, this is an interesting point, because you've been doing a course on understanding social policy, and some of the definitions you'll have had of social, and hopefully you'll have had different definitions of what is social policy, and to some extent, some of those definitions would actually, to some extent, exclude crime policy or criminal justice policy as being something different. Because, obviously, one of the key... Um, definitions, for instance, of social policy. The, the aim of social policy is to redistribute resources to some extent, or to determine the distribution of resources. Um, and, and to do so normally, presumably, with, a, with, a, with an eye on greater fairness and, and equality. And many people would say, well, criminal justice policy has got nothing to do with that. Criminal justice policy, if anything, is about cementing inequalities or, to some extent, certainly denying resources to people defined as crime. So in that respect, criminology and criminal justice policy and crime policy do not fit neatly within the sort of social policy domain. Other definitions of social policy are much more comfortable. Risk management is another contemporary definition of social policy, which is that social policy should be concerned with ways in which societies protect themselves, which may be through resources, but also through other mechanisms. And if we take that more contemporary view of social policy, about managing risk, um, then clearly criminal justice policy, criminals and offending being one sort of risk that people in society face, you can, you can begin to fit... Um, criminal justice and crime policy within that sort of rubric. Another version would be that social policy is about social inclusion. It, it is about bringing people together in society in as inclusive a way as possible. Again, crime policy doesn't fit comfortably within this definition or this working definition because arguably everything we do in terms of criminalisation um, and criminal justice interventions is mostly about social exclusion. It's about punishment and pushing out. It's not about pulling in. If we had a more idealistic version of criminal justice policy where there's a great focus, say, on um, restorative justice or reintegrative shaming, for instance, and there is, a, there is a great advocates for that within the Scottish criminal justice practice community, if that was the, the fundamental basis of criminal justice policy, then we could fit within social inclusion. Because restorative justice is about restoring offenders to their communities. But realistically, that is not a focus, that is not the mainstream focus of criminal justice policy in Scotland or in England and Wales. The focus, realistically, much as there's talk of rehabilitation, or the practical effects, maybe not the focus, the practical effects of criminal justice policy is to exclude and to push out. And then the final definition of social policy, social welfare is providing and sustaining um, collective well-being. And again, whether or not criminal justice policy fits here, um, you can argue. So the, 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 there is a sort of, depending on which version of social policy we work with, will depend on whether we think criminal justice policy has a place within the broader um, social policy field. But in practical terms, there's no denying that criminal justice policy at government level has become very, very influential in, in, to, to, a, to a much greater extent than it merits, probably in terms of resources, um, that, that, than, than, it has, that, 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 than it has in the past. Let's have a quick historical perspective, change the shift away from the conceptual. Of course, I, like most of probably what you've covered in the social, other social policy lectures, the institutions and the things we talk about, particularly when we talk about criminal just, the criminal justice system, are very, very modern. We take for granted, we assume that policing, prisons, prosecution, that these are ancient and well-established institutions in, in, in our societies. In fact, they are extremely contemporary. Um, they are um, largely come about with the, the period of enlightenment. Have I missed a slide there? Oh, maybe it's just not there. It doesn't matter. Um, prior to Literally the 18th century, we had no modern prisons. We had jails, which were merely for holding people, um, often to extort fines or prior to execution or doing beastly, nasty physical things to them. Um, there were no police until the first modern police force was founded in 1779. Does anybody know the first modern police force? First proper modern city police force? Any guesses? No. Glasgow. 
Um, funnily enough, it went bankrupt. So the Met now claimed to be the first modern police force because Glasgow sort of was set up and then fell apart again. But it was actually the first modern police force. The merchants of Glasgow established Glasgow City Police to, to protect their commercial interests, essentially. Um, so policing is a very modern thing. Prior to that, we had sort of village constables of sorts, but it was a very feudal-like arrangement. Um, punishment was very dispersed between the state, the crown, between church courts, which were much more concerned with things to do with wills and testimonies, and sexual deviance. The church loved sexual deviance. Um, the, the crown dealt with other things. And then there were also local justices of the peace, which were often tied to the sort of local feudal lords, etc. Um, so justice was very dispersed, and it was largely there for the rich. Because it, you couldn't, if, if somebody committed a crime against you, there would be no prosecution unless you paid for it. So for the vast majority of the population, the state and criminal justice was, was something you, you avoided to a large extent. Um, prosecutions were, were, were there for the wealthy. It was only in the 19th century that, that a formal prosecution process began to emerge. And that was actually as a charitable endeavor. The first, the first process was, was a group called the Association for the Prosecution of Felons. It was actually established as a charity to encourage um, the, the greater use of prosecution, prosecution powers for the moral well-being of society, because the feeling was, well, if only the rich can prosecute, then all sorts of crimes are going unpunished. So there was a sort of investment in prosecution. Um, so the things that we think about as being the, the criminal justice system are actually very contemporary. And it's largely tied in, as with a lot of social policy institutions, with the, with the 18th century, with the enlightenment and the emergence of urban society. Um, and, and not a concern particularly with uh, an exclusive concern with criminal justice policy. There were no sort of criminologists in the 18th century. What there were were a series of polymath individuals like Benson and so on who were concerned with the entire design of society, with government with public spaces, with sanitary arrangements, etc., etc., and, and order, ur order within urban societies and keeping the peace and so on was just one of many preoccupations that they typically had. It was about how do we regulate our population in this very new environment of the big, increasingly industrialized cities. Um, and it was to the extent that there, were, there was no real science of the offender, offender as such. There was, no, there was no particular interest in why people committed crimes, merely just a preoccupation with punishment as, as, a, as a means of achieving deterrence, of a means of deterring crime. So and under that sort of classical framework, um, it was a notion of simply getting the scales of punishment right um, to ensure, as I say, the punishment fits the crime. Um, so no preoccupation with social conditions or the underpinning causes of criminality, just a preoccupation with the institutions of imprisonment, in particular in policing, to ensure that people got caught, and as equal citizens, if they got caught, they would receive a fair and equal punishment relative to their crime. And the notion that, that in itself the punishment would then lead to reflection, possibly, and repentance, and re ultimately um, that would do the job. So no real criminology at this stage. And the extent to which there was evolution and development in criminal justice, early criminal justice institutions, much of this actually relied on often charitable and campaigning individuals who looked to improve these institutions much for their own um, convictions that it was actually right to treat people better, that women within prison had special needs, uh, so it was often very much based around religious-based conviction that actually you shouldn't really be leaving people to, to rot in prisons, that uh, young women, for instance, picked up by the state for, for various things, prostitution or whatever, in the female prison establishment, needed some sort of help. Needed, and for instance, Elizabeth Fry uh, did a lot of work around educational initiatives with women um, in, in, the, in, the, in London. Um, John Howard equally was a very influential early prison reformer, but it was largely based on his own money and his own energies and his private philanthropy. It wasn't based on any sort of academic analysis or government, really, analysis of, of the conditions of prisons or what you should do about them. It was about a sort of very practical assistance. So the early accounts of the criminal justice system are those of modern government, um, of 
fair and equal punishment, and to some extent, some humane concerns being fed in on the, on the, on the basis of the individual convictions to try and improve the conditions in those systems. This is, that's a sort of very uncritical version of events. There are much more critical accounts as well, though. Um, these are particularly provided by people like Foucault or Ruchin Kirchheimer or Douglas Hay, who would see the emergence of modern criminal justice as fundamentally tied to the emergence of modern capitalism. Um, who would see the establishment of prisons and the greater use of prosecutions not as an improvement in society and providing justice for all and a fairer basis of justice, but actually being fundamentally tied to the growth of the new middle classes and middle class property. And the need to legitimate and protect that property through new laws and statutes and through more formal enforcement and more formal punishment. So the establishment of the police to protect the middle classes and the establishment of prisons to punish the working classes who have the audacity to intrude on middle class property rights. And this is against the background not only of the emergence of industrial goods and middle class wealth and luxury, but also the enclosure, fundamentally the enclosure of our agricultural lands, the removal of traditional rights of common grazing, of gleaning, of taking bits of the leftover harvest so that the, the working poor could sustain themselves, um, and really being dispossessed from the, those common rights in the countryside. And, and so this critical account is this, this, this is the middle class is protecting their new boundaries. Another account, Rush and Kirchheimer, would talk about prisons as actually working hand in hand with factories. They are factories with walls. And essentially what prison is there to do is to tame, discipline and produce docile and productive bodies for factory labour. And there are two versions of this thesis. One is when there is a recession and there's a surplus of labour, prisons are there to soak up that surplus labour, to keep people docile, to stop revolution, to keep them productive ready for work when, when there is work available. The other version is that prisons are there more fundamentally, even during, posit even during affluent times, um, as I say, to take the, the, the more um, unproductive elements of the working class and to discipline them, um, to get them to accept the meagre wages and the harsh conditions of working life in the factory because conditions in the prison will be so much worse. So it is, in a sense, it's a deterrent function for the working classes to accept their lot, to accept their low wages, and to accept their harsh conditions. Because if they go into prison, they'll be on the sort of, you know, they're, they're, that's a classic sort of Victorian treadmill. So that's not productive labour, that's just grinding, what we call grinding roads. It's unproductive, hard, uh, but it's designed, in many would say, as a sort of critical criminologist would say, that was designed to discipline people to, to, to work in the workforce. Um, and that would sort of tie into Foucault's idea that prison is just one of the modern institutions of government which is about disciplining the population and, and moving beyond discipline through formal institutions through to disciplining the population in terms of their body and their, their, their outlook as well. In the same way that school disciplines us, it's just one more institution that in other ways are forcing us into a certain framework for the modern era. A sort of carceral society that Foucault would talk about. So there, there, is, there, are, there are these sort of benign accounts of the, the, the emergence of the criminal justice system. And then there are much more critical quasi-Marxist accounts of the relationship between, of this emergence and um, the, the emergence of, of capitalism or contemporary capitalism. Where does criminology come into this? It doesn't within a British jurisdiction, hardly at all. Lombroso, of course, with the, the Italian early Italian criminologist sort of established the science of criminology, but the British weren't interested, actually, even though Lombroso's ideas were largely drawn from the psychiatric records of Maudsley, who was a, who was a British doctor. We weren't interested in that. Um, to the extent that we had an interest, or we allowed for some interest in the background of offenders, it was merely in the guise of psychiatry, of mental disorder and health. The reason the British weren't interested in Lombrosian criminology is it wasn't for the legal system and the legal professions, both in Scotland and English and Wales, had absolute primacy. And the classical notion of deterrent theory, that we were all equal citizens and we chose to commit a crime, had absolute priority. So the notion, if you start introducing background factors or you committed the crime because your mother didn't look after you or you committed the crime because um, of your poverty or you committed the crime because you were a criminal type, that invalidates the whole legal system. 
essentially, because it's no longer about you making it as a rational actor and making a decision to commit a crime. So it, that sort of criminology was rejected by the legal system. The one thing the legal system would allow was that you were mentally disordered. So the exception to you being a rational actor who had made a, 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 a calculated choice to commit a crime or not was that you were, you were, you were barking mad, you, know, you, you basically committed a heinous crime and you were sent off to Bedlam or some other institution. As, as mentally insane. So psychiatry was the one exception to, in the extent to which criminology gradually emerged. And actually, the first criminology posts were established in Birmingham by local magistrates after World War I. And again, this was within the framework of psychiatry because World War I led to essentially mass um, occurrence of post-traumatic stress disorder amongst this, this, um, this you know what I mean, soldiers who went back to the civilian population. Huge, there was a huge spike in crime rates, as there always is after a big war, as, as shell-shocked, traumatised soldiers basically couldn't adjust back to contemporary life. Um, and actually, it was local civic common sense that thought, well, it's not acceptable simply to imprison and criminalise this population. We need to do something about it. So that led to the first formal... Um, a, appointment of a, a, a professor in criminology to deal with these issues. Um, and then really beyond that, so it was psychiatry that moved it forward. And it was only really at the point of World War II when the initial issue in psychiatry and offending moved into an interest in, in child development and education and parenting and offending. And a series of studies and research areas that addressed the problem of juvenile mental issues and delinquency associated with the traumas of World War II. Uh, can you name what was obviously the main trauma of World War II for young people? Apart from being bombed and shot at and parents dying, what, uh, what else would be the main trauma? What was the obvious event that happened to World War II? That was almost a mass experiment in, in child um, something. Can you name it? Take a slightly more London perspective. What happened? Anybody do history? What big social experiment happened in World War II? Mass evacuation, yeah? A mass experiment in maternal separation of millions of children from their mothers for years in some instances, yeah? The other thing that happens, obviously, all the teachers went to war and there were loads of old biddies and old duffers who couldn't actually teach very well and maintain discipline in class, but that's another issue. But mass evacuation of children led to a cons also a lot of latchkey children, a lot of kids basically running wild because there was a lack of general supervision, led to a problem, a, a sort of moral crisis in juvenile delinquency in World War II. Um, and that led to more criminological endeavour and scrutiny of what can we do with young people in terms of, of those issues. And also a gradual growth in study of offenders within institutions, both young, young offender institutions and formal prison institutions in terms of the reform of offenders. It led to a government interest in these issues more formally. And the social conditions. The other thing that World War II did is draw attention to the abysmal social conditions of those children that were evacuated. One of the big social changes and arguably the foundation of the welfare state, well, the, fact, the political foundation of the welfare state that made the middle classes accept the welfare state was their sudden exposure to millions of children living in the inner cities who they never encountered. It's the physical exposure of the middle classes to slum kids that arguably was the, the, the thing that tipped the middle classes over, made them morally accept that actually maybe the welfare state was something that they had to, that was something worthwhile. Yep. Um, so the government took more of an interest. The Home Secretary in the immediate post-war period, Rav Butler, had a particular personal enthusiasm for doing things, for government doing more about social conditions and their relationship to crime. And he established the first, ne the first century um, sponsored criminology posts at Oxford, um, at um, LSC, and most famously at Cambridge, at the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge. And the first appointee of the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge was a guy called Leon Rad Sinowitz. Um, and Red Sinowitz had a per set of personal preconceptions which led to how criminology influenced social policy pretty much through the next 30 to 40 years. Um, Red Sinowitz believed that better employment, better housing and better health would help reduce crime. 
But Radzinowicz was a Polish refugee who had a great loathing of state interference and coercion in people's lives because he had encountered and escaped Nazism. So Radzinowicz did not feel that, well, though he felt a better society would produce less crime, he did not feel it was the role of criminologists or criminal justice to interfere in social policy to achieve that. For him, he felt the study of criminology should be focused on those people who are really damaged and in prison, or in young offenders' institutions, and that he would leave it to the welfare state with a more well, universal welfare provision to provide the good society that would reduce criminality. So not providing welfare on the basis of good behaviour or housing on the basis of good behaviour, just providing good welfare, good jobs, good schools, good health service would produce, based on early criminological thought, a better society. And this is what we call the Titmus paradigm. So it's that, balance, that, it's that notion that society will deliver the goods, criminology will keep its nose out of things. It's a sort of separation out. Um, of course, what happened next? In the post-war period, um, the black striated lines are crime rates, the black white lines are offences, and the, the, the solid line going up is gross domestic product. So basically what happened next is it didn't work. Gross domestic product went up, we all got wealthier, the crime rate went, went massively sky high, as did the offending rate. Um, so Rad Sinowitz's dream that the good society, we had an NHS and built beautiful houses and schooling was better, etc. Rad Sinowitz's dream that these things in themselves would reduce crime rates and the propensity to offend didn't seem to work. Can somebody provide me the obvious plausible explanation for why crime rates shot up in the post-war period as gross domestic product rose? Why did crime go up at the same time? Any ideas? More goods to steal. Yes, affluence produces goods, produces jealousy, produces envy, produces want, produces crime. So in itself, more affluence did not necessarily mean more equality, of course, or did not necessarily mean more relative deprivation. We didn't even understand what relative deprivation was then. Uh, we just believed in the sort of poverty in an absolute sense. Um, but anyway, the, that didn't work in itself. And everything that the criminologists were doing within prison didn't work either, was the bitter blow. All the programs, the Institute of Criminology in Oxford and LSE and then Edinburgh was, joined the quartet, the sort of holy quartet of, of criminology institutes later. Everything that they were doing in prisons to try and understand the, the etiology, the causes of crime, and, the, and produce programs that would reduce recidivism weren't working. And famously, Martinson produced a report in 1974, which was a sort of meta-evaluation of all criminal justice programs, and the report was simply entitled, Nothing Works. And that was a famous blow for criminology. It was a basically a cry of despair that everything we were doing seemed to make matters worse in terms of recidivism, repeat offending. Um, it also happened to coincide with the oil crisis of 1974, which hopefully you might have appeared in some of your other lectures. In the 1970s was when the money, the money tap was switched off, and that fundamentally affected the configuration of social policies and how states configured themselves with much less money. Um, so it was a crisis that these programs weren't working, suddenly a crisis in terms of the, uh, the overall welfare deal in terms of how much the state could provide to its citizens in terms of welfare benefits and generosity of it. Um, and that led to radical changes. Initially it read, led, and Skull's written about this, to a period of decarceration ironically because actually one of the implications of not having any money anymore was that we couldn't actually afford to keep people in prison as much either. So one of the early steers on that was actually, well, let's reduce the prison population because it's a terribly expensive thing to do. Um, and people often portray the early Thatcher government as terribly punitive, because Margaret Thatcher was a bit nutty, and she did talk a very punitive language. But actually, she had equal interest in her purse, purse um, strings in the early period. And, and the Home Secretaries under Margaret Thatcher, particularly Douglas Hurd and Willie Whitelaw, actually were given a large degree of independence in terms of criminal justice policy. Um, and they used that independence increasingly to start lowering the prison population. So our later Thatcher's policies became much more punitive, particularly under Michael Howard. But to begin with, actually, it was actually pulling back from the, 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 the sort of criminalization and, and the size of the criminal justice estate. 
Uh, the policy that uh, Cavadino and Digman have talked about this, the policy we call it punitive bifurcation, because what you had is a policy that on the one hand tried to reduce the costs by reducing the mass imprisonment, particularly for minor offences, but at the same time tried to please the tabloids and the general public by talking a really tough talk about more serious offenders. So it was really a tough on the nasties, being really so punitive in terms of the, the public language, while privately behind doors actually trying to reduce, particularly to the extent to which young people were prosecuted, convicted and imprisoned. There was a much more increased use of informal cautioning, for instance, by the police during this period. So it's actually quite a, a muddy picture. It's not a simple picture. Um, then later, things picked up again. During the end of the Thatcher era, when things got more conflictual, they had the miners' strike, and then things moved forward. Again, the punitive took over. And when you raise public expectations through constant punitive language, the criminal justice system sooner or later catches up, and judges start using sentencing more, and the police get more punitive, etc. So things did gradually reverse. Um, then we got to New Labour. as Tony Blair, Pudsey Bear. It is... Children in need tomorrow, so I thought we had to use that photo, I'm afraid. Um, and New Labour came in actually with just as harsh a law and order agenda, agenda as the Conservatives, because for them, law and order was the way in which the Conservatives always outflanked them. They were always portrayed as the party of welfareism and being soft and being over empathic. Uh, and so part of New Labour's pitch was to say, well, actually, we're going to be as tough as the Conservatives on crime. Um, so they ranked up the focus on crime and increasingly actually on disorder as well. And the way they did that is to talk about the importance of dealing with crime in terms of we as a state will help you, so keeping the welfare element, but you have a responsibility as individuals to do something about it as well. And we'll come to that in a minute. So they ranked up the focus. It was increasingly politicised. became a dominant policy issue. And ironically... It, even when crime was going down, as it started to fall down steeply during the 1990s, such was the rhetoric around crime that nobody believed it was going down. People sensed that crime was going up and fear of crime increased, even while um, the crime rates were lowering. And confidence in the criminal justice system also decreased. People just didn't believe the crime rates because there was so much rhetoric in the press. New Labour had talked, had, had courted the tabloids so much with its tough on crime rhetoric that nobody believed things were getting better. So crime remained a central cell. It's the way New Labour liked to win over the right-wing press, to some extent, to its cause. And the, the dominance of crime in the press is out of all proportion to the actual budget spent on criminal justice. Criminal justice actually only accounts for about 4 to 5% of government budgets. That's tiny. Compared to housing, compared to um, general welfare, compared to schools, hospitals, it's, it's piddly money. It really is small money. But the amount of noise that it generates, the amount of heat that it generates in terms of political debate during this period is out of all proportion to that. So it takes on great political importance while actually not, being, not actually having much money at all. The other aspect of criminal justice during this era is it still remains... The problem of crime, as, as, as looked at by criminologists, still remains firmly within the domain of the poor and the disadvantaged. So Hotchin, for instance, looked at the prison population in Scotland about, about 2003. He did a sort of analysis. Um, and basically, the 18% of the prison population came from wards containing 18% of the population. Um, well, the rate of imprisonment for 23-year-olds men from the 27 most deprived wards was 25 times greater. So if you came from the sort of bottom 20, 30% um, of wards, you're 25 times more likely to end in prison, for instance. Um, only it's still predominantly male, 16% of convictions are against women, so it's still probably about me young, poor men, essentially. Typically suffering multiple forms of social deprivation as well. Um, so Labour's response to this was an acknowledgement that yes, it was still to do with multiple social disadvantage, um, but clearly just general universal welfare provision was not enough. Just giving people things was not enough. So they began to use the, the welfare levers, and there was less money for welfare as a whole because of the, the oil crisis, and the state generally had less money. So they began to use welfare more conditionally. We will help you, 
we will provide you with extra programs, we will provide you with housing, we will do this, that and the other, but you will have to behave in, 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 in turn. So it's this sort of conditional welfare creeping in and criminal justice beginning to affect, uh, or criminology and crime policy beginning to affect wider social policy provision. They're no longer going to leave it to the good society to provide low crime. So this is where we get this tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. The welfare state no longer independently left to do its, to do its bit, but entitlement to welfare used as a form of control. Um, and the criminal justice policy, in, as in other areas of social policy, moves away from an emphasis on general social inequality and deprivation to one of individual community and family responsibility. So really looking at how individuals and communities help themselves to address some of these, these broader issues of inequalities. So this is the sort of the, the language to some extent of rights and responsibilities. And criminology provided the perfect theory to fit within this new political landscape. And that was control theory. And if hopefully some of you can remember from 911 last year, control theory was that bit of criminology that instead of going, well, what are the causes of crime? Why do people commit crime? It was, why do people not commit crime? And it was a theory that focuses on those things that lead to an attachment to conformity to society. And the, the, it was very heavily supported by empirical research. And it emphasizes things like social bonds, good family relationships, effective parenting, etc. Um, and that played very well with the new labor agenda because it allowed them to focus on helping families, helping parents, etc. Um, but also giving them some responsibility for that as well because it was, it, it was about those sort of slightly micro situations. It's not just about providing a house, providing schooling. It is ensuring that the person in the house with the children at school are also parenting well. Um, so it's that, that, that state beginning to focus on that more micro level. It's also moving away from a universalism and moving towards what we call um, more situational aspects of crime. Control theory moves you away from what we call tertiary prevention, which is prevention that focuses on offenders and trying to inform them, towards more what we call secondary prevention. And secondary prevention is focusing on communities and individuals at risk. Accepting that the offenders who are, once they're offenders and they're in prison, they're too hard to deal with. Tertiary prevention is ineffective. Instead, the, the focus becomes primary prevention is focusing on the whole of society to prevent crime. Secondary is we can't afford to do the whole of society, so we'll take the at-risk populations and do something about them. Um, so it's dealing with problem families, dealing with problem communities, however so defined, the at-risk and the New Labour introduced a whole series of policies around things like Sure Start and parenting orders and things like that, which were mechanisms that were designed to address those risk groups and to, to, to ensure that there was degrees of compliance um, with the sorts of assistance that they were being given. Equally, when New Labour focused on urban regeneration and regenerating often high crime impoverished areas, Crime prevention was often one of the lead mechanisms that was behind those efforts at urban regeneration. So rather than just general regeneration, it was often crime, and dealing with crime first was often um, the first priority. And criminology has always provided plenty of empirical evidence to support these sorts of approaches. I'll just provide one example around crime, youth, and families. So we know, going right back to... Um, the World War II, that parenting was important in relation to crime. Bilby did one of the earliest studies which looked at juvenile um, theft thieves, and he, his empirical explanation that it was to do with maternal separation, linking it again to evacuation. And it was a lack of that maternal bond that led to what he would see as a, a sort of, uh, um, a sort of problems in, in terms of personality traits um, that, that led to youth, youth offending. That was updated much more by what we call developmental criminology, which is associated with people like Farrington at Cambridge, which looks at the life course of offenders and links it to things such as childhood experience and parenting and so on. And Farrington and West did a series of a longitudinal, famous longitudinal study 
and they look at things such as the size of the family, conflict in families, discipline, um, again, maternal separation and, and issues like that, um, to determine what are the risk factors associated with criminality. Um, and that, to some extent, can feed into very right-wing um, agendas. It's bad parenting, supervision, attachment. Um, it's broken families was the classic one. That if a family is separated or broken, if you're in a single parent family, you're more at risk of both experiencing inequality, deprivation, but also crime. To be fair to Farrington, Farrington did updated studies that said, well, no, actually, it's not just about being in a broken family, it's what is the causes behind being in a broken family that are then linked to risk. If you are in a single parent family because you have escaped a situation of domestic violence and abuse, you are much less at risk than you were in the family unit. Um, if you are in a broken family because somebody's died, you are actually at risk of quite um, deprivation and poverty, but you are not more at risk in terms of, again, involvement in criminality. So you do actually have to look at the explanations behind those sort of social categories rather than make sweeping judgments that this equals that. Um, Nevertheless, the theory is that the empirical evidence is strong and it's attractive to policymakers. Um, it emphasizes both individual explanations, parenting is to some extent individual choices and decisions, but nests them within broader structural explanations. It was attractive to new labor in terms of, we'll provide you with structural help, but you'll also have to do your own part as an individual. So taking parenting as an example, yes, we know that poor parenting, latchkey kids, weak control, is associated with all sorts of social problems, even in middle class parents and kids, as well as working class parents and kids. And that, and that actually, if you are a working class parent in a high class area, your kids will be very much more protected if you parent in a certain way. We know all that. But if you're in overcrowded housing, if you have mental health issues, welfare is, is, is inadequate, etc., 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 noise problems, can you parent effectively? How likely is it that you can then be this model parent? It's much, much harder. So it's an acknowledgement that structure does matter, that structural help matters, um, but individual assistance with that also matters. So it, 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 the, the, you know, the tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, that sort of back blend was attractive. Stressing structural help but individual responsibility. And that led to a whole series of policies on New Labour's part that went beyond the old dear either to universal welfare or the rights individualism and blaming individuals. The third way. The purpose of social responsibility and social action should not be to replace individual responsibility, but on the contrary to improve the chances of its development. So a whole series of, of social policies that mixed and blended coercion with help. Child tax credit, sure start, preschool provision, parenting classes, all often very early intervention based, parenting orders, probationary tenants, etc. Yeah, so, so some things that were coercive, if you don't get your child to school, you can be prosecuted, but lots of things around helping you get your child to school as well. We'll help you with parenting, but also if you continue to be a problematic parenting, you may lose your house, there may be probationary tenancies, we may introduce probationary orders, uh, parenting orders, etc. So this sort of blended approach. Generally, there are lots of problems and opportunities with these sorts of social policies. And this is probably a key one to draw on. Criminology provides us with lots of empirical evidence that having attribute X makes you at risk of Y. Being from this sort of family structure makes you more at risk of poverty or criminality. We can, we, we can prove that statistically, but there's a big difference between prediction and um, well, prediction is never as accurate as politicians think it is. So I might say to you, right, being from uh, this style of, being living in this sort of area is 0 0.0001 statistical sort of um, statistical significance. And that sounds very impressive to a politician. They think, ooh, that's really statistically significant. It's a really strong association between this factor and this factor. The problem with statistics is that sounds impressive, but that may merely mean that if you have the attribute, your chances, say, of being an offender is 10 in a 1,000. And if you don't have the attribute, your chance of being an offender is 5 in a 1,000. Now, I hope you can see that still leaves 990 citizens with the attribute who are never going to be an offender in either scenario. Now, if that is your basis of social interference and social policy, it implies either you're going to have to throw an awful lot of money at an awful lot of people for, for a le relatively limited result, or you're at risk of stigmatizing 
a large sweep of people when actually only a small sweep of people would ever have been in, in bother in the first place. So what we provide as a science, we have to be a lot more modest about this. What, we, what, 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 what our theories say are often um, quite imprecise. Um, early intervention can be very effective, undoubtedly, with children in particular, around parenting and schooling, etc., in terms of reducing risk factors. But it's also, it depends how you introduce it. If it's, we're going to intervene in your life because we think you're in danger of being a future hooligan or young offender, the danger is you're stigmatizing them from the off as a problem category of individual. And that has all sorts of damaging long-term social consequences. Um, the great potential to stigmatize, and Kemshaw talks generally about this issue, um, the risk is this notion that risk is overtaking need, so that people are being prioritized on the basis of being risky populations rather than prioritizing welfare and social policy resources on the basis of general need. And is that fair to people who are at need but may just not happen to, to um, possess the risk characteristics? If you provide wide provision, so say you've got an impo a, a deprived community, you provide very wide provision, the provision is often too dilute because everything we know from program evaluations is that if you, to genuinely help at-risk individuals, it has to be quite specialised and quite high concentration. If, it, if you provide it across a wide area, it's often too dilute. Um, but if you concentrate it, it's often too stigmatising. So you've got a real tension there between do you really focus down on the people you genuinely think are most at risk but potentially stigmatise them as the real problem kids? Or do you provide a more universal service but run out of money or not provide enough? Classically, Sure Start, which were excellent programmes, often became too dilute. They often, in fact, a lot of their summer activity schemes and things for sort of diversionary activity got actually colonised in many instances by middle class populations living around those Sure Start programmes. You thought, well, this is a great summer programme. Let's send um, Johnny over to that. Um, and that, that dilutes what you're providing. Um, lots of tensions around whether coercive approaches work. Does it help to get a kid to school if the, if the mother can't or won't cooperate? Does it help to then criminalise the mother? Simple answer is no. Um, some coercive approaches have been shown to work. Um, drug treatment and testing orders, the element of coercion seems to work in that context. But in lots of other contexts of people leading chaotic lives or really struggling with their families, coercion and punishment generally just seems to make things worse rather than actually incentivizing to, co to cooperate in the first place. Um, there are also constantly in social policy logical contradictions in the suites of policies that you produce. So there's this, this thesis that crime policy has affected lots of areas of social policy, and it has. It's infected housing, medical provision, schooling, etc. But the Home Office and the Justice Secretary up here are only one bit of government. And at the same time, there are lots of other policies going on that may completely contradict what one bit of government is attempting to do. So to take a classical example, or sorry, a classic example, or many classic examples, there was lots of that education and inclusion in New Labour. That, and, and all the empirical evidence shows is if you have young people who are in trouble, the worst thing you can do is send them to a special school or kick them out and exclude them from the school they're in. It almost guarantees a life in potential offending. The best thing you can do is help them in special units within the school they're in. You keep them with their peers. It's the dignity of staying with your peers. It doesn't matter if you're in the same class. It does matter that you stay in the school. But at the same time, New Labour, on the other side, on the education side, were of course pandering to this notion of parental choice and league tables and improving standards. And that created quite the opposite incentive, because if you're a head teacher of a school that wants to have middle class parents sending their kids there and improving standards, the last thing you want to do is retain your problem cohort of children in their special class in your school, kicking off and using up all your resources. So you find ways to exclude them. So with all the best will in the world of government trying to be enlightened, the reality of government in across all social policies is that all these different ministries are often at war with each other in terms of resources and priorities and ideas. And the notion that it all works together, frankly, is, is rubbish. It just doesn't. There's, there's constant fights and tussles and things cross over and, and contradict each other. Um, the other classic example I would say, all the, all the research would say that parenting is important and staying with a young child is extremely important in terms of life chances. But then the government decides that single mothers should be coerced and incentivised back to work as soon as possible. Contradictions and problems, essentially. <laughs>
particularly when the single mothers in more deprived areas then don't have access to any decent um, childcare provision. So not only do they have to leave their child at a younger age, but then they can't get their child into decent um, nursery care anyway. So government is often not joined up. Um, final slide that really matters. The, the, the idea is that by spreading crime policy into general social policy, by trying to deal with things more in the community, by having more community punishments and interventions, the idea is, is we draw bigger populations into criminal justice. Um, we widen the net and thin the mess. So we, we, rather than punish people formally, we might introduce them into community programs. But non-compliance with the community program then can lead to punishment. And the idea is you actually end up engaging with more people within this dispersed and slightly hidden criminal justice control net than you would under the traditional. Because at least in the days of the PC pod doing an informal caution, you clip around the ear and send you on your way and say, go away, Sonny. Now, PC Plot is drawing you into a community program where you are actively engaged with as a problem. And if you do not comply with that program for whatever reason, you then may be accelerated up into the system. And we have this within Scotland. The children's hearing system was designed to keep people out of the criminal justice system. And ironically, it ended up probably engaging and pulling more children into the criminal justice system. So that we now have a new program, um, which has also been superseded, which is like a ring road to the ring road, um, which was again intended to divert people from the children's hearing system. So you keep them away from the children's hearing system and then they won't get in, drawn into the net in that way. Blurring is another kid, the lack of distinction between control and punishment and welfare and criminal justice. And this notion that penetration, far from reducing the role of prison, community penalties simply increase the scope or reach of the penal system. And what, of course, we have now in Scotland is through care. And the prison service is making a big push for its personnel to be the people who go into the community to assist offenders. In some ways, I think, with very good intentions. But in other ways, the prison is coming out. And the prison officers are coming into the same problem communities. Is that a more enlightened social policy? Or is that a, a drift in terms of redefining social policy as crime policy? OK, that will do. Thank you very much indeed. Have a lovely um, rest of the day. Some good reading at the back. <laughs>